My name is Álvaro Enrique. I am the director of the Dreaming Out Loud program. Even when the word director doesn't match my personality at all, I, I feel more like the instigator of the program. We began this four years ago, maybe five. I am not that good at keeping dates. The idea was to make a meaningful event in the Pen World Voices Festival, not an event that could be only words, 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 but an event that could chip a tiny little piece of the works of the world, something that, that, that could, I don't know, modify the reality a tiny little bit, but that maybe is enough for a human life. We had the idea originally of making a workshop with undocumented workers, but it was really difficult, it was complicated, not everybody wanted to share their experience, and someone came out, I don't remember whom, with the idea that this was a group of friends thinking about it. There was Jakab, the previous director of the Pen Voices Fest, World Voices Festival, there was Valeria Luiselli there, and there was more people. I, I don't remember the group. Anyway, someone came with the idea of working with dreamers, and everybody was like, yeah, what were we thinking about? So we went and asked for the help of CUNY, and CUNY gave us their support, and we were able to put together a group of 12 brilliant young writers that wanted to produce literary material related to their living experience that happened in between February and May of, I don't know, 2016, maybe 17, I'm not sure, 15, one of those years. And after the, the late reading of the students, every year we make a reading in the New York Poets Cafe, and this is what you are looking at, is a, a, a virtual version of that, the, the little head that came out there was my daughter. Can you show up and say hello? Hi, sorry. That's Maya. She has been a constant present in presence in the workshop, so it's all right that she's in this one too. Anyway, we, we put together the group. The idea originally was we, we all have our fixed, silly, and sometimes dumb ideas. One of them was that the students good or the young writers good speak Spanish. We opened the, the invitation and what happened was that we had a group of students that came from all over the world. We had like a little World Cup, a little tiny, very elegant and literary World Cup there. So we began to work in English first with the migration experience and the dreamer experience and very political texts and mainly autobiographic material. When the reading came, as I said, in the New York Poets Cafe, this was on a Sunday, the last Sunday of the festival, we invited the, the young writers to have dinner after the event. And then one of them said, but this means that we will not meet next Friday, Alvaro. And I was like, well, I will be here. We, we, let me ask our friends in Penn if we can storm their seminary table in, in Soho and keep going on Fridays. That happened, I insist, four or five years ago. And we are still meeting every Friday, no matter if there is a pandemic, if we have sources of money or not, no matter how what, every Friday we sit down together and produce. First it was, as I said, testimonies. Now we are producing literature. There are writers in the group that have finished books. There are writers that are uh, getting like very important scholarships. There are writers that have been admitted in, in very prestigious creative writing programs. And this had happened just with persistence and the will of writing. 
the will of keeping writing no matter what. In the later years, the, the, the workshop has become so, I would say, even scary successful that, that, that the support of, of, of CUNY and the mayor of the city of New York has let us open another four workshops during the springs. Those are located in Queens College, Lemon College, and Medgar Evers College in Brooklyn. All of these colleges associated with CUNY, uh, pro workshops that have their own faculty and their own group of students. Those workshops only run during the spring. Mine runs the whole year, except these weeks when I disconnect and leave New York City to write a little bit more than usual, and during the winter vacation. The rest of the time, if you go, if you are a dreamer, and you go any Friday to the offices of Soho, of Pen America in Soho, you will find us there from four to six, reading sometimes poems, sometimes novels, sometimes stories, sometimes uh, memorials, all sorts of, 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 of things that are produced and, and keep expanding in, in the same vein. I'm taking too long, I always take too long, I'm sorry. But, but in the same vein, I, I would say that the first time we did a public reading, this is a public reading, but the first time we did it in place, we have very few people. We have mainly the family of the dreamers, maybe one or two disoriented people interested in the problem of migration in the United States. This was all the Obama era, so, so the, the drama was not so intense every minute, every day. You know? So it, it, it was a short audience. After two or three years, one day I'm just before the reading, I go to, to, to the Camerons where the young writers are preparing to read their work in public. And I tell my every year speech, you know, we will not have audience. There will be very few people. They will be mainly our families, but it doesn't matter. That's how it is. And that's how it will be forever. Remember that literature is not the most popular of the arts, but there will be readers there and it will be important. For them, whatever you say, your words will change their lives. So go and do it. I say this, and I said, okay, I'm going to pick up a coffee, and we begin. And I go out next to the New York and Poets Cafe. There is a, a, a Cuban coffee place where they do an excellent coffee. So I go out to get my yearly uh, coffee cup for the event. And when I see the street, I see that the line not only gets to the end of the block, but turns and keep growing. When I return, I just told the writers, people, here we are. No? And here we are again. No? This is the yearly reading of the dreamers, the most dramatic, the most fun, the most intense event of the year, at least for me, that have a very peaceful life. So thanks very much for coming. Be welcome. Please enjoy the reading. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us. My name is Nicole Gervasio, and I'm PEN America's Program Manager for Dreaming Out Loud. I wanted to quickly introduce you to tonight's unique virtual reading. Many of the 50 or so immigrant writers in our workshops are undocumented or have family members who are. For this reason, the readings you'll witness tonight take a wide variety of formats. Some will read directly from their work, but others will use only audio, and still others will read their works against the backdrops of their own original photography and films. We hope you enjoy this one-of-a-kind multimedia experience. You can find many of the stories and poems you'll hear tonight in volume two of our Dreaming Out Loud anthology. It was just released this June, and it's available for purchase on Amazon. We thank our supporters at the Mayor's Office for Media and Entertainment the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the Vilcek Foundation for making endeavors like this possible. We're also so excited to welcome five authors who are also advocates for immigrant rights and writing to share some words of wisdom and readings of their own with you and our students. Throughout the program, you'll hear from Carla Cornejo Villavicencio, Sonia Guinansaka, Jenny Zhang, 
Javier Zamora, and Martina Majak. And with that, let's turn to our first reader, Tabasham Jahan Islam. Hello, my name is Tabasham Islam, and the piece I'm about to share is an excerpt from a conversation about being American, which I wrote collaboratively with Ms. Nazifa Hussein. We were inspired to create this project in our work with immigrant women who are survivors of domestic violence, sexual violence and human trafficking, and refugee survivors, and realizing that there are so many different ways of coming to this country and how the immigration process can be a traumatizing experience. In this short piece, I speak about my personal experiences going through the immigration system as a young child and the effect it had on my family. I remember standing in front of an immigration judge and I remember the judge questioning whether I was a boy or a girl. I remember my parents frantically trying to find a headband to put in my hair to signify my gender, to say, she's a girl. <laughs> Even then, I recall the judge's face, not amused. I remember feeling very, very uncomfortable because I had to stand on my feet for a long time. And it was painful because I wore my shoes on the wrong feet. So my left shoe was on my right and my right shoe was on my left. And I remember that I knew I couldn't say anything to my parents because it was such a hard and grave moment for them. I remember them being so nervous and scared because we didn't know what the judge would say. In New York City, I live, surrounded by mountains of Maryland blocks that melt up to the sky, while in the horizon, the sun rarely says goodbye. Nevertheless, here, confined behind glass walls, I met the moon. I remember everything, except time. Here, it has been nice to see the night, the dark side of the daylight, where the moon lives and shines with no fire, where she plays with the skyscrapers glittering with no boredom. The city lights don't let me see beyond the darkness of these seas of stars. Hatching the roots, Water bore my tongue Every time I take a sip from my poblana talavera mug The moon whispers in my eyes What she sees from outer space I listen to her Her crunchy voice scratches the window A window that hasn't allowed me to touch her cracked skin However, I contemplate her. Behind and through her glassy eyes, I feel her warm light running down my bones. My thought becomes extraterrestrial, becomes from other world, a cosmos, frontierless, the light reflected by the moon touches the dark side of my silence. Perhaps the pain that my tongue tries to go with makes me hallucinate. My mind was crazy. Nonetheless, I am an earling. A strange thing on your Facebook wall, a weird image on a Zoom screen, a stranger in this world of nations. Nonetheless, I drink tea as everyone else, who hangs on the trees of this artificial life. On the moon, I escape, 
out of control. I flee from my mind. And as always, the moon is the shadow of my bones. A moon that recognizes me everywhere I go. A moon that waves the sun rays as a flag of my freedom. Isn't the moon beautiful? Hi, uh, my name is Erica Papala. Today I'll be reading three poems. The first one is included in the anthology and it's called A Ghost Woman. Miha, I grew in a town so far away with the mountains that I walked, with the music from my grandfather's voice, with the book of, of my sh mother's shelf. Miha, I loved your mother. I felt for her so quickly and suddenly. I gave her a rose because she loved flowers. I took her to the river because she loved swimming. I never got to say goodbye. She never said, I love you back. Miha, I love your mother. I went far away because I needed to find a job. I learned that she was carrying you. She never told me. I learned from her sister who called me. Miha, I loved your mother. I died in the arms of my father who helped me when a car rushed into my lungs. I fell for your mother. She never held my hand. I loved your mother, but she loved another. Miha, I hope that your eyes can see me. I love your mother. I love you. And they're an oasis of roses and snow. The second poem is titled, In a River. She remembers the rocks in the river, hidden beneath the coldness, shivers in her arms. Images flash in her pupil. Someone holds her closely, releases her quickly, moves in the solace of the afternoon. Silence spoke. Rewind to the morning where a girl swam. Her lungs carried her forward, released from the trap, no longer hidden beneath the night of shadows. The last poem is titled On a Tree. With her foot on the trunk, her fingers felt the skin held it tighter eyes focused up top. She reached higher, high, very high, forgot the earth below, imagined herself living inside the leaves, bitter green, swallowed the small frame of hers, shifted her body, swivel her reality, below where the darkness of the monster clung onto the scars that receded each time she climbed that tree. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Maria Jose and I'm a writer at Dreaming Out Loud. My piece is titled, To South, October 23rd, 2019 to the present day. My body is a Westchester house that I will never be able to afford. With a clean cut lawn mowed by the Mexican from downtown, sipping tea on the porch with her pinkies raised up high in our conservative neighborhood. A pool that I don't use because of my body image issues. French doors let the light shine through to kiss the grand piano that taught my fingers how to bleed. And most days I can't make it out of bed. I only get up to greet my insomnia knocking at the door. I'm a perfect home to raise an undocumented girl, the fear of deportation crawling under her brown skin and wearing dark braids like a backbone. DACA is a two-year subscription service. American, but Mexican not. Immigrant prayers under the Coyote Express whispered under her breath. Her parents constantly pressuring her into being a straight-A student, even if they said they didn't. Perfection was always expected and nothing less. Her art was violated, her life to be put on hold in order for her dreams to be turned into nightmares. I achieved perfection, the perfect balance, the best version of myself. I was perfect. This is what I wish I said to my first therapist before she called 911 and I went into a psychotic break. I felt my downfall. I blamed it so much. Fuck gravity. I repeated to the paramedics the information I had told my therapist, then the same to the nurses and again to the on-site psychiatrist. Admissions papers flew everywhere, a fresh manicure clicked on the keyboard, latex gloves snapped onto the wrist of the medical staff, and there was that unforgettable smell of disinfectant. Congratulations, I told myself. 
I had passed the suicidal behavior questionnaires for the fifth time since my treatment began. My score bought me an invitation to a psychiatric institution. I was stripped down to have my portrait taken like one of those French girls. Every bruise, scar, and wound was painted from the bristles of a paintbrush that touched every curve of mine. My only scars could be found inside my inner arms, a response to being less than perfect at one point in my life. The night was beautiful, but I felt watched, delicately watched like a snow globe in the palms of a 12-year-old girl. It was midnight when that same snow globe slipped and crashed from the little girl's hands. The shards of glass made snowflakes. They were tempted to make contact with her skin, but instead she paused as the base of the snow globe read, Welcome to Two South. That's when she knew she was no longer perfect. I realized my symptoms had surfaced throughout the years. My second psychiatrist mentioned that I should have started treatment when I was 12, my first attempt at the same age, then the second at 16, and my third at 20. I'm 21 now. My mental illnesses have been playing hide and seek behind my smile as it faked its way through life. I was dying in silence, and this was me speaking louder so someone would listen. My suicidal thoughts have been part of my identity ever since puberty. While developing major depressive disorder, extreme anxiety, and a bipolar 2 disorder, which would not be diagnosed and treated for another nine years, I'm swallowed by my own mind. I was banging my head into the walls, not out of insanity, but to be heard. I was losing track of time. I was losing control of what was imaginary and what was reality. I had a blender of thoughts. A conversation jumping from one person to another across the room. It consisted of tasks, puns, and childhood memories. Happy pills were planted in my mouth like seeds to grow into trees. I went from antidepressants to mood stabilizers to antipsychotic medication in a span of five months. And that amount of time I was truly at rock bottom to further swim, swim into the abyss. I had a perfect attendance record for staying alive. Eventually, I was spun into a chrysalis to be frozen. To be discharged meant to have broken free from this prison built around me, only to find out that my wings were eternally pinned back for display. I was stripped and analyzed only to become another statistic framed onto their walls. What they didn't realize was that my illness is a shapeshifter, ready to distort the image that is my life. Thank you for listening. For our first guest, we're so thrilled to welcome Sonia Ginyansaka, who has some poetry and advice to share with every undocumented writer out there. Hi, my name is Sonia Ginyansaka, and I am an artist, poet, national culture strategist, and I am super excited to join you here um, on this virtual space to share some poetry and also to share some words uh, for you all, dreamers and undocumented writers, uh, part of this project. So um, the first poem that I want to share with you is called Calling Cards. And I don't know how many of you remember, but um, calling cards were these like plastic cards that uh, we would buy at bodegas or grocery stores and you'll scratch the back and um you use the numbers to call back home and so in new york city with my family um that's one way that we were able to communicate with folks who were in ecuador and um so i wrote this poem uh for calling cards one across oceans and land working to connect one phone line with another like an umbilical cord these five, 10, 20 square cards are more than plastic. These calling cards have heartbeats. Two, we survived through phone lines, a cycle of dining numbers. On the other line waited abuela. On the other line waited memories. On the other line waited birthday wishes that should have been given in person while eating guava cake. But we, we were here and you, you were there. On the other line, we waited by pay phones. We waited for your voice. We waited. That is all we had. My dad waited for you. He still does. Three. How do you die a loved one? 
when your fingers have worn out from weaving too many memories, when your voice has changed since the last time you saw them in person, your bones have broken from their absence, your lips have weathered, your face is the only clue left of what they might look like now, perhaps it's best not to look in the mirror. Perhaps you are too ashamed of holding on to old memories. Four, I can still hear Abuelita Alegría's voice. Abuelita, ¿cómo está Ecuador? Sí, sí, Abuelita, prometo que regreso. And then a long pause. You hear her shuffling the phone, trying to remember which side to talk from. She's not familiar with this technology. I call it old school, some call it poverty. Abuelita's gentle voice rocks me back to memories of when she carried me as a baby. My face lays flat on her back. She hangs up and I lay gripping onto her words, trying not to let go. Never enough minutes. Five. Calling cards don't have heartbeats anymore. They just hang in the store, teasing you. Now, Dad stops at the bodega for other reasons. His mouth curls up around the rim of the bottle, longing for one more conversation. I think he believes that with every beer, he gets closer to heaven, closer to her, closer to home. And secretly, I wish that was true. Six. The phone goes unused like the passport in my wallet, no more dialing. And his palms rest spaces when my grandma is buried. And even then, even then the lines on his hands restrict him from getting too close. Dad wants to hold my hand, but mostly we look at each other, hoping to find comfort. He says that I look like Abuela. So that was calling cards um, and the last piece that I wanted to share with you is called actually yeah the last piece that I wanted to share with you is called glory um, and this is for my mother um, for a woman of color for all the femmes of color who have shown me how to resist and exist um, during this time and so I wrote this poem for them Glory. Mi mamá se levanta. A las siete de la mañana se baña sus pies bendecidos en agua es divina. Después empieza con su maquillaje. Her brown hands gently holding the black eyeliner for a migrant woman. These are lines she welcomes. She places her dark brown hair in a bun carefully placing bobby pins, like carefully placing lipstick, like carefully placing hope on land. Mommy's knowledge teaches me that my wings are meant to be thick, meant to take up space. These are rituals I grew up with, so I repeat every morning, creating self into existence between lipstick and softness, between borders and belonging. These are ways I survive, so I repeat, arching my eyebrows, jewelry over my neck, red nails pointy enough to hold homes. Homes I am building, homes I left, so I repeat, adorning all of my genders like the gospel never sung at my church. This, we become biblical. Let this be an ode to femmes of color whose celestial eye shadows crack the heavens, whose thick thighs resurrect possibilities. So I repeat, what glory we incite, what glory we create, what glory we fucking are. Um, thank you for listening to those two poems. They are from my first chapbook called Nostalgia and Borders. What I have to tell you is that during these times, your role as an artist, as a cultural worker, as a writer, is to reflect back what is happening. So take the time right now to write, uh, take the time to also rest, 
um, but take the time to create and imagine the worlds that we need to imagine because this is not it. We need worlds without borders. We need worlds without detention centers. We need worlds without prisons. Um, and I truly believe that it is you, uh, fellow artists, fellow writers, um, who are gonna help us imagine that. And so right now, if you are able to, please go create, continue creating. And when you need some space and some time to heal, take that time also and to rest up right now for us to have any type of social change, we need artists and culture workers like you. So congratulations on this amazing journey as an artist. And I can't wait to also listen to your poetry and read your writing and see your performance on virtual platforms. My name is Danata Watson, and I will be reading After Birth, The Sun Will Come Out. After birth, walk downstairs without departure assistance. On swollen feet, no wheelchair needed. Right? <sighs> During delivery, only Shanta was able to find my veins. The two nurses before her could not find it. Please stop encouraging me. Please be quiet. I'm not pushing hard enough. The baby is not coming out. After birth, my spouse chuckles. <laughs> you were so polite while in labor. So many please and thank yous. <sighs> black maternal health just trying to come out of this alive <sighs> the baby is in the NICU we will not go home today together <sighs> I am strong I look strong warrior black woman swollen feet preeclampsia pulsating vein in neck, tachycardia, hyperthyroid, elevated sugars. <sighs> Don't cry. You are not a victim. The sigh seems to seep deeper and deeper these days. 5 a.m. and 5 p.m. heparin, 9 a.m. metformin, 3 iron pills daily. Finish prenatal vitamins. Get rid of pregnancy basaglar. Keep pregnancy novolog as reminder. Check sugar. Check pressure. Make appointments mine. And for the first child and now the new child, call insurance. I wish I was able to protest, to write, to post, to riot, to... Do you have any woman to help you? Yeah. Yes. I have no woman to help me. No one cares about the woman after birth. Pandemic. Don't forget the pandemic. The killings. George Floyd. Brianna Taylor. <sighs> Don't cry. You come from strong women, warrior women, worker women, women incapable of self-care. Cry. Just a little. Immigrant black woman in America. While on maternity leave, new supervisor shares, I need to work on expressing frustrations more professionally. You is an angry black woman. Me? <sighs> Smile. Behind the mask in a pandemic while praying for black women, black trans, black little girls and boys, black men, black immigrants in America. <sighs> Breast milk is dwindling. 
I am strong and black, black and strong. The Trader Joe's lady at the register made me sit down. <sighs> Don't cry. The black one that talked a bit too much and came off just a bit too ghetto with a smile said, Oh, you just had a baby. Oh, congrats. You shouldn't be out and about. Do you need a chair? Sigh of relief she sees. No, 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 thank you. Swollen feet. Can you get her a chair? She just had a baby. You know us black women, so strong. She needs a chair so she can sit. I wish I could protest. Write, post, protect the black. Breathe. Sigh. He called for his mother. Cry. It is with gratitude that I share a few lines from my writing for the anthology through Pen America's Dreaming Out Loud workshops for the piece written by M. Vasquez Vasquez, A Short Little Haunt. Usted, usted hágalo sin miedo. Guela assured her, no fear. Outside our house required a physical border of protection with a quartz grid. Holy water, salt, and other things, among other things, of elements and prayer. Strong prayer for the ascension of the spirit. Mommy did just that. She mustered up her courage. She called upon the ancestors, asking for guidance and protection. With that, she let loose on the aberration with the fierce tongue lash laced with mandiciones to banish the dead. Decades later, after my mother passed away, I found myself back on Grouston Street. I found myself there to empty out our house, tie up loose ends. Neighbors had just closed on the house next door. Of course, I went in to look. I was flooded with memories of what the room had looked like before. Flooded with memories of my most beautiful friend from childhood. The loss had been so sudden. As I stood at that front door, flashback, glass grapes on the coffee table. There, near where the sumptuous couch sat, I recalled the organ she once played so gracefully. I looked closer and I noticed a deep, dark area on the carpet, a saturation. It was deep red. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Enrique Peña Oropesa. Um, student at Queens College, immigrant from Peru. Um, first of all, I wanted to say that I'm really happy that uh, Javier Samor is gonna be in today's reading because actually the poem that I'm about to present uh, was inspired by some of the poems that he wrote in his book and accompanied um, that he even signed for me when he went to Queens College a few years ago. Um, so I guess I'll start with my poem. Um, it's called Abuela and it goes like this. Mama Maruja, forgive me if I wasn't around. The land had ceased to provide and I had to move. It's tan difícil vivir en los United, knowing that I lose you, but you'll always be with me. It still hurts, Mamita, to think 
of who I was back in Peru. I wish I had time to show you the new me. I wish I could call you and tell you about the day I met Fulano Mengano, or how I'm, how I'm no longer studying engineering and I'm not as shy as before, and how I'm surviving in college with the computer you bought me almost eight years ago. There's so much that you missed. I wish I had danced more with you and spent more time in your home instead of my phone, hearing your stories about Grandpa Rodilio. Hope he's now next to you, eating your sopa seca and ceviche that you cook con tanto amor that I miss. I hope you know I'm fighting real hard. This land of the dream sometimes brings me nightmares, but I just want you to be proud. I can still hear my dad sob every year around the date that you left, but he does it at night so no one can hear him. I don't think he remembers college kids never sleep. I'm sorry he came here with me and he wasn't right there to give you an adios. That is something I'll never be able to forgive myself for. But if he went back to Peru, he wouldn't be allowed back in. La vida es dura sin papeles. Mama Maruja, there's so much I could say that I couldn't before. I was told you left peacefully in your sleep and that mi tia Marcela and mi tia Mari dress you in silk. Yeah, the mask did your makeup and you look like an angel. So I promise I'll fight and I will make you proud. And by the time that I walk up stage and get me diploma and I finally get my American dream, y cuando tenga mi propia familia y mis hijos y nietos sean both peruanos y Peruvian Americans. And my time finally arrives to close my eyes and fly home and beyond. I know you'll be there, waiting for me, to hug me one last time, for all the times we missed. Thank you. Next up, we have the poet Javier Zamora. He was born in El Salvador and is currently based in Harlem. He's the author of Unaccompanied, the poetry collection. And we're really excited to have him here tonight to read some of his work and to share some thoughts with our writers. Hello, my name is Javier Zamora, and I'm a poet from Herradura, El Salvador, and I immigrated here when I was nine years old to be reunited with my parents. And I'm going to read you two poems, and then I'll say a little bit about why I chose this poem. And the first one, um, I know when I came here, it was I came to California. And it was difficult to stand out. This is like 1999. Not a lot of people knew Central Americans. And so a lot of people called me Mexicans. And then sometimes even here, when I moved to New York City, people thought that I was Puerto Rican. And so this is a new poem um, that's for um, Salvadorans, but mostly Central Americans, um, trying to say that we exist. Okay, I'll read. No, actually... Soy salvadoreño. El salvadorian, salvadoran, salvadorian, los muy muys. We don't even know what to call ourselves, how to eat a pupusa, fork and knife, or open it up and treat it like a taco. But then we're betraying our nationalistic read, anti-black, anti-indigenous impulse to not mix with anyone else. And what's with jalapeños in the curtidos y potes, with using spicy salsa instead of salsa de tomate? There's too many restaurantes, one side of the menu, Mexican, the other, platos típicos. Typically, I want to order the ensalada, but then they bring me an actual salad. I say, Coman miércoles. They want to charge me extra for harina de arroz, extra por los nuegados. There's nowhere I'd rather be most than in Abuela's kitchen, watching her throw bay leaves, tomatoes, garlic, oregano into the blender, then chicharrón, helping herself to everyone that knows she made the best pupusas from 1985 to 2004. By then, salvadoreños became hermanos lejanos. We traded Colón for Washington. By then, 
los hermanos Flores looked for new singers every time they returned from Los United to San Salvador. Stay, no se vayan, stay, no sean dundos, was all those Salvadoreños could say. We didn't listen and came here only to be called Mexican or Puerto Rican, depending on the coast. We had to fight for a better horchata, not the lazy, wider one with only rice. And when we didn't want to fight, we tried to blend, speak more Mexican, more ira, more popote, more no pos guau, no majes, no se amagan dundos, pónganse trucha vos. When anyone wants to call you Mexican or Puerto Rican, you can just say, no, actually, andate a la M, hijo de puya, racista, cara de nacionalista. Um, it's my first poem, and yeah, I think it's important to say where we're actually from, but also to question the countries where we come from and how racist our own countries, our own homelands are as well. For a long time, like I came here when I was nine, for a long time I idolized or idealized the place that I had left because I couldn't return. I couldn't go back to El Salvador for 20 years until I got the Pesa, which is what a lot of Salvadorans have. Um, and so, for a long time, I didn't question the politics of my country. But now, having the opportunity to go there, I'm like, wow, um, El Salvador is messed up as well. And so, especially now with everything going on and why I'm speaking to you not in person, I think it is, as young people, it is also our duty to push back against the racism that Latinos are very... Um, ingrained in and latinidad is ingrained in as well and okay and as somebody who had good grades in high school went to a top university um uc berkeley and got my mfa i always felt that there was this push towards being the model student and i just want to remind you that that you shouldn't add a pre yourself uh, some pressure to your own self, and you should just allow yourself to be a full human being and not compartmentalize different parts and and perform for different people, um, which is what I did for a long time and what I have done in these institutions. So now I curse in my poems. I curse when I talk in front of people, and because I, I'm not about the respectability as well. And you may feel it. And for a long time, the dream movement felt like we had to overperform in order to be considered equal. And I just want to remind you that you don't have to, that you can just be yourself. And it's the problem of this government and of politicians, because it's their problem that they don't see us as full human beings. And Okay, um, that's what I wanted to say. And I'll, and I'll read you this next poem. And I think I've started writing this way because for my first book, it was all about my own trauma and my own sadness of not having papers, of not seeing my grandparents for 20 years, etc. But I'm also trying to add joy uh, into my poetry now. And if you were born in the 90s, um, you probably know this merengue singer named Quinito Mendes. So now I'm trying to incorporate some merengue into uh, poems that are still very political. So for this next one, you have to know Quinito Mendes and you have to know his um, song. It's called Cachamba. And it starts, uh, it's kind of like a riddle. Hay un hoyo, hay un hoyo, hay un hoyo la orilla del mar, hay un hoyo la orilla del mar. And so um, that's what I try to do. And it's about the wall. And it follows the chain of command of um, the government or ICE. And so this is my interpretation. 
and thank you for listening. There's a wall featuring merengue legend Quinito Mendez's Cachamba. There's a wall. There's a wall. There's a wall where people are tanning Speedos bikinis inside of a hammock on top of the wall near the Mexican desert. There's an agent. There's an agent. There's an agent, chicken necks running toward the people with speedos, bikinis inside of a hammock on top of the wall at the edge of the Mexican desert. There's a deputy, there's a deputy, there's a deputy who ordered the agent arrest the people in speedos, bikinis inside of a hammock on top of the wall at the edge of a river in the Mexican desert. A commissioner, a commissioner, commissioner who said no, secretary who said yes to the deputy who ordered the agent running at people tanning speedos, bikinis inside of a hammock on top of the wall at the edge of a river in the Mexican desert. There's a secretary, the secretary, secretary who told commissioner, I'm in charge, commissioner who told deputy, no, who told the agent, arrest the people tanning speedos bikinis inside of a hammock on top of the wall at the edge of a river in the Mexican desert. The president, oh, the president, President who said, you're fired, to the secretary who said, I'm in charge, commissioner who told deputy no, who sent agent running toward the tanners and speedos bikinis inside of a hammock on top of the wall at the edge of a river in the Mexican desert. And the wall is me. Yes, it's me. I'm wearing a speedo. Yes, he is. Inside a bikini. Yes, he is. I'm not Mexican. No, he's not. Let me tan, please. Let him be. Please let me breathe. Let him live. Fuck the BP. Yes, fuck them, please. I see, I see, I see, mamacita, I see, I see, I see, I see, mamacita, I see, y ya. Bueno, gracias y sigan adelante y be your full self. My name is Heidi Manila and I would like to read my poem, Tilet Special Letter by Heidi Manila. Dear Immigrant, I wrote these lines to welcome you and let you know that you are important, smart, and strong. You are not alone. I know how you feel to live in a new and different country in the United States of America. The American life is an opportunity to be successful in different ways. Now, you are a new member in this country and you need to learn some important facts to enjoy learn and become a new version of yourself. I could like to help you and advise you with some important experiences that I have to face, many obstacles to be successful woman. Some years ago, I heard a woman say, I have been living in this country for 20 years and I do not speak English. I have been working as a housekeeper for a long time and I can't find a job anymore. When the woman finishes, Say her words, I feel so sad. I visualize her life in my mind, and I refuse to have the same experience. This lady's story gave me the courage to stand up to become a new version of myself. Thus, I decided to change my life because I didn't want to live the following 20 years in the same place, doing the same things, and thinking the same way. When I arrived in this country, I repeat to myself, I came to this country to make money and I was doing the same things as the woman made and her words resonated in my mind. I have been living in this country for 20 years. Those facts were painful and strong in my life that pushed me to change my mind and life. Changing is a long, painful and a slow process, but we have to go through this process if you want to make a new version of yourself as I did. You should do some change, such as become determined and strong to face the obstacles on your way to make a better version of yourself. Changing my life was hard, even in poverty, loneliness, and facing domestic violence some years ago. However, I decided to improve my life. I started to save money to pay my English school, spending less time to work, and finding someone to take care of my baby while I was taking my GED, learning English, sleeping a few hours, and study hard to become a student college. I also found some resources to cover my financial needs, to cover my tuition school, and I meet some nice people who advise me and help me 
to be a successful. Asking questions, looking for opportunities to be educated and become a strong mind and humility human. You will find resources to be success, even though you are an immigrant and undocumented people, you have rights to be in college and become a professional undocumented people and change our lives forever. Sincerely with love, community health worker, your best friend. Hi everyone, my name is Cherry Lu Sai and I am one of the teaching artists for PEN America's Dreaming Out Loud program. Around May, we were supposed to just meet each other and listen to each other's stories at the New Yorican. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic this year, that has not happened. And this is uh, the other option that we've come uh, across to just do everything uh, via you know, the internet. I traveled two hours one way and then two hours back from my home in Brooklyn to get to you. And having every one of each and every one of you in class was just an incredible experience because each of you brought in something different to, to the dynamic of the class and also the stories that you shared, they were they were heartfelt, they were creative and imaginative and some of them the humor really stood out and then we shared cultural stories. I just want to bring to everyone's attention that telling your own story is important, you know, uh, and I hope that taking this class with me has whetted your appetite and that you go on, move forward and write more and share your stories, not just to yourselves, but to other people, you know, keep writing, keep reading, keep smiling, keep hoping. I miss each and every one of you. I hope I will see you again soon and that we can share a meal as we were doing during the, the class. Okay. Bye everybody. The Ocean Path by Dreamer. I came for a seven hours walk, uncertain and irksome, which smelled a lot. Several different odors interwove, putrid, sweet, pungent, warm, and sour. Those that are born and grow here in the north, so different for me and my memories. Putting up the compass for the ocean, I came to see this ocean in the north. I came to see an ocean as silent and warm, which I didn't expect. Under the night at the ocean, caution is required as much as it is in life. When you can see ahead, it what direction we are stepping. Be careful, advise the ocean. Don't sink. The ocean is not always unholy. Sometimes it just sits there, biding on the wind's touch, heavily or softly, waiting for the sun to come and go, hold by the metrical dance of waves. The ocean is in today. Maybe it's just a way to embrace the earth and never to give it up. At every sunset of the ocean, says there is always love around us, even when the desired future is dreamed and be part of a piece of land disguised as a foreign. Hello everybody, my name is Jeffrey Sherabin and I am from the Queens College Dreaming Out Loud program. And I will be reading my parody poem, Pledge of Grievance. I pledge my grievance to the flag of the United States of America, and to a republic for which it stands, one nation, blunder God, divisible with captivity and ruckus for all. Thank you. Hi, my name is Maria. I'm a student of a Dreaming Out Loud writing workshop, and today I'm going to read my poetry, and the name is Wave Your Hand to Mars. Alina is sitting on the windowsill in Harlem and smokes a treasured rare cigarette. Natasha, behind the wall, 
under the soft light of a night lamp, eagerly swallowing the Bible in the hope of finding salvation for at least one more day. Someone is knocking on soft keys on a nearby street, trying to write a better resume and certainly find a job. Now, in May, when we already have 30 million without a salary. Let's better board the Elon Musk rocket and fly to Mars. Trimmed Matt Damon with already grown potatoes will be waiting for us there. Nicole Kidman will dance as flamenco in a light transparent nightgown. I will know them. I'm an actress. Well, yes, on Mars I'll definitely become her. And at night I will be writing children books and send them in large parcels to Earth. Yes, to our Earth, which by that time will be inhabited by other people with new destinies. They would not know about the killing virus. In their world, children raise adults and ask them to eat porridge in the morning. I will run barefoot on the red Martian sand and dive into its craters. We will make a library in the fresh air. In the cool night hours, I will read my stories to children. Once we will sit late near the campfire and sleep soundly under the universal stars. With the dawn, in the morning, it will turn out to be a dream, and I will be banning the keyboard again in Brooklyn, near a lush green park. Alina eagerly lights another small cigarette, and Natasha will turn on the nightlight and open the Bible. She will read the, her favorite line, and we'll all be healthy. New York will be covered by the summer heat. Central Park is filled with tourists and camera clicks. I'll probably take cold iced coffee in a big transparent glass with a plastic tube. I look at the sky and wave my hand to Mars and to Matt Damon. I promise him to fly next time because on our Earth it's very good to live now. Thank you. Now we're going to turn to Carla Cornejo via Vicencio, who published her debut titled The Undocumented Americans This Spring, and who has some words to share with our writers. Hello, writers. Uh, my name is Carla Cornejo via Vicencio. I'm an essayist and author and dog parent. Uh, I am in Connecticut right now, but don't worry, I'm a New Yorker. Um, I uh, I'm the author of the book, The Undocumented Americans, which just came out this spring. It's a punk manifesto, a collection of essays where I traveled the country to places where I felt safe while on the ECA, um, interviewing undocumented immigrants and talking about my families falling apart. And uh, also talked about my own story, uh, largely with mental illness. Um, and chronic trauma caused by attachment issues, abandonment, and also migration. Um, I'm going to read you my um, piece first and then we can talk. So, oh, I should tell you why I'm wearing this. Um, I assume the other adults who are reading their pieces to you are not wearing this. Um, so I like to um, have fun with my look and um, this look was inspired by like old school Hollywood glamour, also by Rihanna's S&M video, also by, um, you know, in, in the hood, we know a lot of uh, Latinas and black women wear their hair in rollers and like go out like that. And I've always thought that was pretty glamorous and beautiful. And um, they've often been policed and in a lot of places like charter schools they are not allowed to show up like that so I'm like fuck that you know I think it's beautiful I think it's glamorous um I call this like zoom black tie and um I think I look beautiful okay so my piece is called the only acceptable way I can be approached by ICE a legally binding document it is it it, it has been vetted by my lawyer I wake up very early, weather TBD, but not humid. Hair color TBD, either Kurt Cobain blonde with some grit. Let's say my hair has changed its texture from indigenous good girl, pin straight, but chemically damaged to Malibu tousled. I think your hair texture can only change when you are pregnant and I rather swallow a razor blade, but let's just say. I go to the bank, there is a hostage situation. 
Oh, I am wearing a white pink slip and negligee and my usual Stan Smiths. I am minding my business and I become aware of the holdup. We become hostages, 30 hostages. I am the only hostage of color. The rest are all white, all of them natural blondes. Women, children, cops, firefighters, the works. They are frightened. The bank robber is a terrorist. It is impossible to know his race. I talk to him and we develop a rapport. I earn his trust. The white hostages think I am a terrorist too and spit at me. I go over to the stack of $100 bills he has set aside and pull off the rubber band and tie my hair into a top knot. This is a privilege I have earned, this freedom of movement, this migration. Through my di diplomatic skills, the terrorist is a man, is a man, is a man, tries to kiss me. I stand at an angle, lean in for a kiss, then bam, reach for the gun. I'm not sure how I do it, but I do it. I am so fast. We struggle and I overpower him, even though I have no upper body strength whatsoever. And I do this one move my partner, who is a woman and 4'11", taught me from a self-defense class she took as a child, which is to make your hand into a duck bill and shove it into your attacker's eyes. I do that and he falls. Or no, he doesn't fall, because what I'm about to do next, I don't want it to be cowardly. I shoot him in the knees and he falls. The hostages all run out. I walk out. I have never run after a bus, after a train, after shit. And I don't run away from shit either. I strut out and I'm bloody. His blood is on me, but not a lot, like a tasteful splatter. And the gun suddenly turns into an AK-47. Americans love those. And I hang it across my body like a Miss America sash. And it becomes windy and my hair blows in the wind and the reporters all take my picture, which will be in the front page of all the American newspapers. And I look like a fucking supermodel but of course foreigner, et cetera, et cetera. So ICE officers approach me and try to arrest me, but the white moms come speeding in their Hummers and form a barrier around me and block them and throw little Confederate flags at me, La Reina del Sur. So that's my piece. Um, it was actually a huge privilege. I wrote this piece um, for a website called This Long Century and I was nominated by Eileen Miles, who is one of my favorite writers. Um, we have some time, so I have to give you some words of wisdom, although it is your choice whether to take words of wisdom from someone who bought cheap nail glue. Um, so, you know, the first thing I, I really want to say is to and I'm sure you've done this in your workshop. I'm sure you've done this in your workshop about how you can write about being undocumented in a way that doesn't feel exploitative. It'll always feel traumatic. It'll always feel traumatic, take it from me. Um, I can't write about immigration without feeling headaches, stomach pains, chills. The other day I got a fever, like I, I took my temperature. Um, but you, you, you don't want to write for a white audience. You don't want to write, you want to, you want to think about the affect that you want from your audience and you want to feel good about yourself. Um, you don't owe anybody anything. You don't owe your parents anything. You don't owe an audience anything, a white audience or a Latinx audience or an Asian audience, or you don't, you don't know, you don't owe anybody your story. You don't know, you don't owe anybody your pain. Um, that's probably the hardest lesson I've, I'm still learning. Um, a while ago, I thought the purpose of life um, as someone who struggled with mental health issues and um, thought there was no purpose to life, I decided that the purpose of life was to make other fe people feel less pain. And for that, that for me, that meant my parents and other undocumented immigrants. And soon that began to affect my mental health in pretty profound ways. And then I discovered DBT, which is a kind of therapy for people who are in a lot of emotional pain. And um, what it helps you do is just make the pain less, um, more tolerable. It helps you find skills to make it more tolerable. And it helps you want to find a life worth living. So that I didn't just want to 
stop um, being suicidal, but want to live, want to look forward to things. And it's a daily struggle. And um, if you follow me on Instagram, you'll see that I'm going on a healing journey. I'm creating boundaries with my parents, whom I love. But what I always say is when with we immigrant children, the love we feel towards our parents is so big. And it's, it's sort of like trying to separate um, a salad dressing, the oil and the salt and all of those things. Like what is love and what is gratitude and what is guilt and what is pity and what is obligation? It, you really can't separate it as an adult. So you just have to make peace with it. And a lot of time is drawing boundaries. So I, um, there are other people who can give you professional advice a lot better than I can. Um, but I just want you to know that the number one thing you can do that will benefit your career is to take care of your mental health and to uh, make sure that you stay alive and that you're feeding your soul and that you're drawing boundaries with people who um, are emotionally draining in your life and that you understand that you deserve joy and that you deserve peace. So congratulations and I uh, hope to read all your books soon. Hi everyone, my name is Mariana Alvarez. I'm a Colombian born poet. And today I'm gonna be reading a poem about my parents that I started working on when I was really young and it's finally perfected after a couple of years. So here it goes. The name of the poem is She Is To Me. He speaks to me like the clouds slowly, swollen with a rainstorm but repressed by self-reliance, pent up with all the love he built up for my mother, ready to burst in rain, the downpour reluctant against verbalizing, all the admiration with which he examined the stained glass. Without her, my Monday's blue, Tuesday's shameful, and Wednesday's too. My nights are forged between the limbs of another, while my mind drifts to the sweet summers of your mother's bloom. Green as a meadow, his eyes swallow me whole. My father is the sky. I look up and find the overflowing memories of a divine woman. A divine, a divine woman filled with melancholy, all her compassion dressed as leftover meals, collecting shame and embarrassment in a refrigerator. The sky is consumed with heartache, fractures with a loud uproar, mourns as the lightning enlivens me, hailing repentance, crashes to its knees in a single motion, erupts and searches my eyes for remorse. You fool, she is my light. You sad fool, she is my Sunday evening, my red sky. With that I withdraw, and admire the image of a man, a cloud drained, fatigued, so lonely, exhausted, from feigning love for another, and the deluge that was his love for my mother. Thank you. The Body Remembers When the World Stopped by A.C. Almeida. September 5th, 2017. It was late morning, and I was in the lower, quieter levels of the library. I opened up my laptop as usual. This time, an overly lit photo of Jeff Sessions popped up with the forbearance of what I knew had been coming since the election of 2016. I grinded my teeth, blinked back tears, and felt my entire body deflate. I took a breath. I closed my laptop. I went to my next class. I don't remember the next 10 hours after that. All I know is that I put one foot in front of the other the concrete floor of Fordham Road pushing all its might against my feet. It just barely kept me upright. I never felt so helpless in my life. I got on the train. I made it home. I was pretty pissed at my parents. I shut the door to my room. First came dad and then mom. They cried. They said they wished they could take it back. I was deeply ashamed. Things got worse. Shortly after, there was a traffic stop. It was the closest my family came to deportation. By some bizarre turn of events, it never ended up happening. I got lucky. Many others before and after me did not. My sister decided to leave. For weeks, I had been planning the perfect goodbye. 
I was going to make a Hamilton joke. She was supposed to laugh. I never made the joke. It's a heavy along the curves of my spine. The biggest push for the dream act I've ever seen happened. I spent my winter break down in Washington. I barely slept and ate even less. I'd never been so swollen in my life. I left deflated again. The seasons changed and in came summer. There are pictures of children in cages. There are still children in cages. Another summer comes and a new set of ice raids tear through the country. Parking lots are emptier. Streets are quieter. My community goes into hiding. I remember the wind feeling sharper against my hair despite the heat. A pandemic hits. My community is part of the front lines. My community is starved out of the aid they need. My community continues to die. The pit in my stomach expands. My heart feels heavy. June 18th, 2020. DACA remains on a 5-4 decision. I'm in disbelief. I had prepared myself for the worst. Instead of gasping for breath, I am able to breathe for a moment. I had forgotten what that felt like. Hello everyone, my name is Anna Makarov. I'm an artist and a storyteller, and today I would like to share with you my short story. Funeral of a Hamster St. Petersburg is a city built on a swamp land. Throughout my childhood, swamp was my view from the window. Despite the depressing appearance of the swamp, although my mother loved the swamp, she went skiing there in the winter, my childhood was quite interesting. In addition to my human friends, I was finally allowed to have a pet friend. My parents decided to start small, a hamster. I called him Robert, generally not a very proper name for a Russian hamster. He was so cute and tiny, brownish-grayish color, very sporty and gluten-free. He ate mostly carrots and was exercising on the wheel every day. I loved him so very much. But in spite of Robert, Natashka always remained my best friend. We went to the same high school. She's older than me. She's very tall, like a model, red-haired and with a great sense of humor. Even during the coldest, harshest Russian winters, she always wears a jean jacket and a short crop top that opens her belly button, apparently to brag about her belly button piercing, which she performed herself, naturally under my supervision. Natashka lived from me through a swamp on a hill about 30 minutes walk from each other but I could see her apartment building from my window. Once I was bored and decided to rummage on the mezzanine of my apartment and I found a huge red flag on a stick more than two meters long, bright red with a yellow outline, hammer and a sickle and a star. Mom didn't know where this flag came from because the USSR collapsed a long time ago. Natashka's mom didn't like me. She thought that I had a bad influence on her daughter, and so I could not call her home. That's how our secret code appeared. If I wave a huge communist red flag from my window, this means that my parents are not home and Nata can come over, and we will throw our mini party. We turn on the music loudly, open all the windows and smoke on the windowsill, chatting and flirting with the boys who arrived in time under my windows on the porch. And that's how we had fun, with this magnificent view of the swamp. Until one day, I was tormented by insomnia. It was already after midnight, and I decided to play with Robbie, the hamster. He wasn't asleep also. He was doing his cardio on his wheel. I took Robbie out of the terrarium, but he unexpectedly jumped out of my hands and landed sharply on the floor, but did not get up, fell like a hero, and died. I was devastated. What to do? Who can help me? Who will understand me? Only Natashka. But it is after midnight. 
I cannot call her, her mom's home band. Waving the flag? It's too dark, she won't see anything. 1.30 a.m. Military cemetery. Natashka and I sitting in the snow drift digging the snow for the grave of my beloved hamster. We took candles, flashlights, markers from one to make a cross, shovels and music for the mood. Under the snow is ice. It is hard to dig without special equipment. But I decided that Robert should be buried like a real hero in a military cemetery across the swamp from me so that it would not be too far to go visit him as well. As we grow up, we realize that it is less important to have lots of friends and more important to have real ones, like Natashka and Robert. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to mention how Natashka found out that I was in trouble. It was a brilliant idea. I opened the window, pulled out a huge red communist flag and set it on fire and began to wave. How bright it burned. Nata immediately saw this. All my neighbor's babushkas ran out into the street shouting that I was killing communism and that Lenin would have executed me for this. But what does Lenin have to do with it? I have a dead hamster on my hands and communism has long been dead, deadlier than my hamster. Isn't it? Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Sebastian Gomez. I am the owner of Style Me Savvy, a design and image consulting boutique firm in New York City. Today I will be reading from an excerpt of an essay I wrote titled La Virgen, Mi Abuelita, El Paso y Yo. I am proud to be Mexican, American, Mexican-American, a Chicano. I have as much a right to be in our country as anyone else, no matter our diverse skin colors. When I hear the hateful and vitriolic words our highest elected officials are saying, time and time again referring to me and my kind as murderers, rapists, unworthy, invaders. It's hard to feel comforted, protected, or safe on any level. But mi abuelita, mi nanda, taught me better than to allow those who hate to define who I am. I am proud to be bilingual and bicultural. I love, embrace, and treasure both parts of me simultaneously. I am not afraid of proudly, to proudly represent my identity and humanity in every sense. I know that in the eyes of God, Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe and Minanda, we are all seres humanos who deserve equal respect and dignity. I am grateful to mi familia, mis papás, siete hermanas, especially Fernanda, aptly named after mi abuelita, my Lucio, who is my inspiration, mi Nanda, and to la Virgen de Guadalupe, who all give me strength and courage to continue fighting those individuals and institutionalized systems which perpetuate unjust laws and policies that continue to marginalize and validate racism, xenophobia, discrimination, and hate in our nation. I hope and pray that mi abuelita is looking down upon me and smiling as only she knows how. For I know who I am. Yo soy Mexicano, Americano, Guadalupano y Católico. Gracias, Minanda, por su amor, apoyo, 
cariño, enseñanzas y sabiduría. I appreciate your time. Thank you for allowing me to share this with you today. Ciao. I hope you've all been enjoying these amazing stories and poems from our readers tonight. Um, I'm really excited to welcome Jenny Zhang next. She was born in Shanghai and grew up in New York, and she's the author of the short story collection Sour Heart and the poetry collection My Baby First Birthday and Dear Jenny, We Are All Find. Hey everyone, I'm Jenny Zhang. Thank you for letting me be part of um, your day. I wish I could be there in person. I wish the pandemic was over. I wish the world was a just and beautiful place. Um, but in lieu of all of that, I recorded a poem and some of my thoughts for you. Um, I was thinking about what to say and uh, the only thing I could think of was that it is a very intense journey for anyone who wishes to love themselves and care for themselves while living in a world that does not value them or signal in any real material, spiritual, psychic way that they are worthy of care and value. But that's the journey we're on and we have to create something that was never there which is love and respect for ourselves. And we have to fight for it to be collectively available to all of our friends and family and the people we don't know yet and the people we do. And I know that that is what writing is at its very, very best. This one is called, I'm Not Like You. And I wrote this poem after I did this event with a very um, wealthy white person who I suppose you could say is successful and respected in their world. But I just kept thinking during the whole event, you're kind of a dork. <laughs> and it's sort of embarrassing that I'm sharing space with this person. And I'm really happy that I don't want to be a dork and that I don't want the things that they want. So I wrote this poem. It's called, I'm Not Like You. You just like me because I'm actually interesting. All the years I didn't know that were rough for me. Wasted so much time thanking useless people. Just because they have floor to ceiling shelving and natural light in every room, a car in a parking garage to take them to the end of the nearest peninsula. The history of married men bored of jerking off into their own hands definitely precedes me. Our flesh isn't any softer. We just moisturize and care. And this sheen from fighting makes us glow really nicely. Having something real to fight against is pretty hot, you gotta admit. You and your spouse think it through. You hate me and my friends who address the world from the vantage point of, you know, loins, feelings, a fucking heart. And don't you ever forget it takes practice to access what you demolished. When you see us, you feel something for the first time. You act like you aren't that turned on. The shit that gets you hard is a debased topic and you prefer to keep your pages clean, read critics who describe our ideas as rousing and spirited and important and brave. You live with someone who sanitizes everything, even before this and definitely after. Listen, 
Let your pussy breathe for once in your goddamn life. It'll be easier to come if you don't smell like flowers. My friends and I smell like we've been outside. We sweat through the sheets and take the bus to the beach. We want to play in the waves at the end of the islet. You'd love to rub up against me in person one day, wouldn't you? When I tell you about that photographer, you say you're sorry. Women like me have to constantly deal with men like that. But I know when you go home later tonight, the details from my sordid story are what keeps you going. No one has ever really wanted to fuck the person they've merged assets with. That's why I'm not surprised to know you imagine me constantly, don't you? Underwear bunched down by my ankles, flipped over onto my stomach. You wish you knew me better, like really, actually knew me back then, when I thought I was so disgusting. It turns out I've always been interesting. Not that I expected you or your blood family to admit everything about your fantasy life comes from women like me. Every single time you forgot your earthly problems, felt your flesh a starting point, dreamed real, legit dreams, you better believe it was me, fucking me, and my friends whose names are only uttered when you need to feel better. And if it weren't for us, where do you think you'd be right now? Seriously, tell me, what meaning would your life have if we were no longer buried under the very earth you've been trampling on since the first in your line was born and decided to stay? Thank you for listening to my poems. And um, I guess I'll leave you with this little story. I just moved apartments um, during the pandemic. I had to because I was kind of living in a slum before and I was being harassed by my landlord and all this stuff. Anyway, um, I had all this stuff that I'd been hoarding. Uh, I could psychoanalyze why, but um, probably has to do with being born into a lineage of people who experience like 10 generations of famine and poverty and hunger. Um, and I felt like I had to keep everything. And as I was going through these like little emotional breakdowns trying to throw away all this stuff because I couldn't physically carry it into my next apartment and my next life. I realized I wasn't just getting rid of objects, but I was deciding what are the stories from my life that I'm going to keep and which ones am I going to let go of because I so badly want to have a new story. Because the old story that I lived in and I surrounded myself with was the story that I was too weak and I am too tragic and everyone has a way but not me. It'll never be me. And I had to let go of that stuff. I had to let go of all the things and the totems that I kept around me that supported that story. And I remember when I was 23, I got into the Iowa Writers Workshop and I was telling all of my professors who had recommended me for my MFA programs that I'd gotten into Iowa. And one of my professors, a white woman, she had written me back and she had said, I don't think you should go to Iowa the environment there is extremely cutthroat and competitive and I think that you are a delicate and fragile person and I think it would be too hard for you and I advise you to not go. And I remember thinking, am I too weak? Am I that fragile? Am I that easily broken? And then I thought, fuck that. You don't know me, and you've never known me. And in this last week, I carried all my possessions through the streets of Brooklyn. And I hurt myself physically, I have wounds all over my body and bruises. But I did it. And it's okay if it takes a little bit of effort. And it's okay to believe in yourself. And it's okay 
if the people who claim to see you know nothing about you, it's okay to let them go because there will always be people who do see you. And no one sees yourself as deeply as you do. So I wish for all of you to know that you've already been so strong and you've already been brave and it didn't even take anything. And the world, well, the world is never ready. So thank you for being you and sharing your work and sharing your softness and sharing your strength. And I hope you will continue to do so. Congratulations, everyone. Bye. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here today. My name is Sophie Begum. I am very excited to be part of Dreaming Out Loud because I had buried so many incidents in my heart and brain to avoid confrontation from culture, tradition, and norms. This platform has opened the doors to step in and take out the important pieces of my life experiences, transform that into a cultural context, and share with listeners like you. An unforgettable journey in Afghanistan is the title of my story. In this segment, the main character, Safida, has been just in the process of writing her first biography. Gradually, the beauty of the area, the broken houses, more men and boys than few women and girls, covered in blue burqas, busy with their animals and farming in their green fields, distracted and attracted us. We were crossing them like a series of a show or a movie on the dusty and bumpy road. The debris of destroyed houses, rusty, old and broken Russian tanks grabbed our attention and forced us to think and reflect on what the country and the people must have gone through. The tanks seemed tired and broken of guilt, reflecting on what they did should have not done. They seemed ashamed of killing and taking innocent men, women, old, young, and even small kids' lives. As we kept on passing, I felt the echoes of crying and giving up lives in my brain. It disturbed me, but I tried to stay strong and kept on controlling my emotions. I tried to distract myself asking, let me see what other similarities and differences I see from my own context, but I couldn't concentrate, so I gave up. However, I had seen so many things on TV back home, but finding myself in that environment was now interesting, but at the same time, scary and fearful. When I looked at the Toyota car in front and back of my vehicle, I felt like a queen or an important personality with kind of having security guards in front and back of me. I felt like enjoying, but it vanished all of a sudden. When three people with turbans dropped, dropping their tools who were fixing the water stream ran towards our vehicle. They stopped the driver and he lowered down the glass of the windows of our car and started talking to them. My colleagues were looking at them to understand what's going on, but I, as a woman, I avoided glancing at them because it would have raised cultural, social, and religious issues. My face was covered with my scarf and I pretended looking straight in front of me. Though my eyes were looking at the front, of, uh, front still my fearful, shocking, scary heart and brain was trying to understand the language what they were asking about. But before I understood something, the driver suddenly drew fast like a Knight Rider movie car in American movies in 80s. I looked at the driver to ask him, what happened? What were they asking? I heard the sounds of the stones on our vehicle like a heavy rain shower. It opened my bright eyes. My heartbeat increased and made me numb. I turned around to see my colleagues. I saw a visible fear on their faces. Their eyes were bright like mine with shock and they all looked pale. The rough and tough bumpy road kept on shaking us up and down. 
We were all quiet and couldn't speak for a while. It felt like those people took away our voices and made us voiceless. After a while, maybe 20 minutes, we started talking what happened and why they were aggressive. The answer was, it's Afghanistan. And we have to be strong. You never know when would anybody stop and question you or take your life. You never know because they have gone through so much. Also, you don't know who is a Taliban, who are against development and progression. We may not know when, why, and how would they take our life. Anyhow, we didn't know the reason, so we continued the journey. The incident really made me fearful, but I was trying to convince myself to be brave because I had made the choice, so I had to face it. That's all. Thank you so much for listening and for your support of Dreaming Out Loud. I appreciate your patience for listening to me. And that is the end of my story. Hope you liked it. Beholden by Garen Rodriguez. So tired of being a victim, of fighting for my place. Bitch, if I wanted your job, I would take your job. The blindfold is off. Maybe America is in the land of dreams. Maybe it is in the land of immigrants the land of opportunities, nor the pursuit of happiness. It feels as if the hope has been sucked up little by little. Am I bitter? Am I angry? Honestly, I think I'm just tired. Tired of defending myself, of asking to be heard, seeing so many others barely trying, not even trying at all. Will I never be able to demand anything, the opportunity to purchase a home, the, to receive health care, to not be exploited at work? Will I always be beholden to the meager opportunities we've had to fight for? What more do I have to do to prove myself? Do I want to continue spreading a message of hope? Maybe I should go where I am wanted. Hasn't my family already lost so much? Haven't I? Yet, I close my eyes, take a deep breath in, I picture my family supporting me, and I slowly let my breath out, along with so many frustrations. Perhaps it's only half time. I cannot give up. I push myself to love this land that has given me the audacity to believe in equality, in freedom, and justice. Maybe we have lost too much, but I will continue to fight for my dreams, my love, my love for this country, even with all its flaws. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Pedro Ramos Flores. I am a senior at Brooklyn College, I'm part of the film department. I'm trying to become a writer and director especially for those minorities and people like myself, undocumented. And today I'm going to do the reading of a screenplay that I wrote during this semester. Uh, it's for my feature film. Uh, right now I only have uh, the few pages uh, what I'm going to read today. It's going to be only the hook, which is only three pages. Exterior Arizona Desert Night. A group of five people is crossing in the desert to get to the picking uh, up point to Phoenix, Arizona. They are walking in a light under the moon's light. The place seems calm and we hear owls and coyotes around. Coyote, 35, stops and starts looking around to choose what direction. Coyote, stop. Take a five minutes break and drink water because after this, we are going to start getting to the top of the hill. The five people sit in the ground and start drinking water. Roberto, 48, goes to talk to the coyote. Roberto, how long do we need to walk more? I'm going to start running out of water. We won't walk in the whole night for two days nonstop. Coyote goes to the group and starts talking to them. Coyote, we need to talk downhill and a car is going to wait for us. The faster we walk, the faster we get there. If the sun rises before we get there, we need to wait until the night so they can pick up us. So let's keep going. The group start getting up and start walking in the same line. Roberto is the last one to be in the line. After a long walk, we hear patrols passing by. Coyote, yelling. The border patrol, go down, go to the ground and be quiet. The group goes down on the ground all quiet and looking around the border patrol stops. The group remain in the ground until they don't hear anything. 
the coyote takes his binoculars and starts looking around. Then uh, the people are looking at him. Coyote, let's keep going. They all gone. This is full time we see. You just listen to my direction and we're going to be there to the other side. Let's go, come on. The group stand up and start walking. A few minutes later, they hear the car motor again. The Kujori make a sign to stop and he makes another sign to get to the ground. As they go to the ground, two water patrols pull over and a flashlight on them. The group of people stands up and start running. The officer gets out and starts running behind them and arrests them one by one. They put them on handcuffs and, and in the ground, sitting down. Border Patrol Officer, yelling, who is your Kujori? All the people are looking down and they're not responding. Border Patrol Officer, I'm going to ask one more time. If you don't tell me, why are you going to be here until I find out? The Border Patrol Officers are looking at them. While they don't respond, they keep looking down. After five minutes of constant silence, the officer is still talking on the radio. Border Patrol Officer, Put them all in the patrol. We're going to drive to the facility. The officers take them one by one. It's getting in the back of the patrol and they leave. In the patrol, Roberto's looking at each other and shaking his head. He can't believe the girl will call while the coyote looks upset. So once again, my name is Pedro Ramos Flores and I'm a script writer and I'm trying to become a director and I'm currently a film student at Brooklyn College. Hi, my name is Ingrid G. I'm a student in Dreaming Out Loud. Today, I'll be reading my poem, A Broken Crown, which is deep, honestly, and some of you probably could relate or have experienced it. A Broken Crown. I miss you deeper than everything in life. Today, I realize that everything you told me it is real. I miss you a lot. I really do. I cannot anymore. I simply cannot. I cannot live without you. I'm incomplete with wounds in me. I wish to have you with me. I wish for you to help me. I'm a broken crown. The girl who was just innocent from an abuser. She became broken when he abused her without consent. I need you to listen, I told myself. I'm afraid to be judged by my family. Can I turn back time? It's been a decade within three years that it happened. I'm afraid. Afraid that he abused me again. Afraid to feel his fingers. Afraid to be broken again. Afraid to be judged. Judge without my fault. Afraid that I am unable to say it aloud again. Why did it happen to me? Can you see me? Can you feel me? Can you tell what I'm, that I'm broken? He abused me, I said. I'm a strong on surviving, but he abused me, I said. My heart has a hole. A very deep hole. The hole with bruises since you're not here, I said to myself. I miss the old version of you. I miss being free. I miss being close to him where I am not afraid. Can I forget the day he abused me? Can you see my scars? The day I transformed me into a broken was, was when he abused me. Can he see the broken crown that I became? Will he rub his fingers against my body? Will he touch me again? How can humanity be brutal? How can humans be ignorant monsters? Can I have a normal life? What would my family say? Would they blame me because he raped me? It's rape considered to be normal for men? When I'm just innocent? Innocent for being raped? Tell me, it is a nightmare. Tell me that it's just a bad dream. Come back from your dream, please, I said. Open your eyes. 
I cannot anymore. I cry for you. I need you. Since you're not here, everything has changed. I hope to be with you and repair my broken crown. Do not delay. Please, do not delay. I want to be free. I cannot stand. I cannot stand. The pain has left a broken crown. The pain of knowing I was abused. I've used turned me into a broken crown, I said. Come back. I beg you. Give me strength. There's a hole that's open still. Can I break the silence? Can I repair my feelings? Can I be complete again? How much do I need to suffer? I was only a girl, but the abuser did not care how old I was. Can he understand he harmed me? Will he stop rubbing his fingers against me into my private part? How can he be a monster? How can I pretend nothing happened? Can they see my scars? Can they hear my tears? When will it end? My heart is not repaired. It has a hole. The hole is still there. Under my skin are scars. I feel disconnected. I feel empty. I feel worthless. Almost three years have passed. I feel alive and broken at the same time. I'm a broken crown. I ask. I still see him. I survive from the monster. I'm alive. I tell myself, but when would I become complete? Thank you for letting me share this with you today. My name is Suleyma. My eyes used to see my fellow warriors as the queens who knew who they were. Has it been this long since I stared in the mirror? Now my eyes see discrimination, sacrifice, and disconnection from the Mexican warrior I was to this mixed culture that's starting to bloom inside me. Has it been this long since I stared in the mirror? My skin used to resemble La Morenita, which brought hope in times of darkness. Now my skin has broken roots. Has it been this long since I stare in the mirror? My hands used to fit in those of my ancestors who made Mexico bright with colors and dances. Now my hands are filled with these broken promises I made and slowly forgotten. My Spanish is now broken. My traditions are fading. Has it been this long since I stare in the mirror? My mouth used to sing those beautiful songs from Vicente Fernandez to Ana Gabriel. Now my mouth sings songs in different languages. Has it been this long since I stare in the mirror? My heart used to beat to the rhythm of my traditions and beliefs. Now my heart beats to a rhythm of a city that never sleeps. Has it been this long since I stare in the mirror? My tongue used to taste my abuelitas tostadas crumbling in my mouth, savoring the spices, the sour cream, the tinga, the cheese. Now my tongue tastes the fast food, cheating my taste buds into believing it's real Mexican food. Has it been this long since I stare in the mirror? My ears used to hear the cuetes and the church bells ringing, people talking and celebrating. Now my ears hear cars honking, people arguing and trains approaching. Has it been this long since I stare in the mirror? Thank you. Hi, I'm Jessica Balderrama and I was part of the Dreaming Out Loud workshop. Today I will be sharing uh, an excerpt from a short story that I wrote recently. Madeline opened her eyes, wanting to savor a few more minutes of silence. The living room was heavy with the scent of cigarette smoke and dust. Musty blinds clung to the windows, and muddy track marks led from the front door to the bathroom. There were dishes in the sink, and empty cartons of cereal littered the kitchen table. The bed had not been made in weeks, and laundry piled the corners of a room. This place is as clean as it would be the remainder of the month. Madeline woke past noon and pulled on a pair of hiking boots. She walked to the neighborhood park without bothering to check her appearance. Leaves littered the sidewalk, and the sun bleached the streets in a white glow. A man with graying hair and clothing too big for his body sat on the bench next to hers. She glanced around to see who else was within earshot. She and the man were the only ones in the park. Neither said a word, 
and the longer the silence stretched, the more she resisted the urge to walk away. There were holes in the front of his sweater, and his eyes were red-rimmed, a scar ran from his right eye to his earlobe. His voice was hoarse, and the edges of his nails were yellow. He looked into the distance, with a strong determination, with a strong determination to not acknowledge her presence. His posture was dignified and sturdy, like stone. He may as well have been a statue. The gray curls of his beard reached down to his chest, obstructing his mouth and neck. Heavy silver earrings clung to the edges of his earlobe. Madeline played with the beads on her bracelet as passerby in the street walked by with toddlers and bags of groceries. She turned to the man and said, Those are cool earrings. It was as if she had not spoken. He did not turn towards her and merely continued to gaze into the distance. The silence between them would have ordinarily caused discomfort, but these two were not an ordinary pair. Hello, sir. Would you like a cigarette? She took out a pack of smokes and turned to him again. She had two left, one for her and one for him. This time he angled his torso towards her and flashed her smile with yellow and crooked teeth. He took a cigarette from the pack without making eye contact. Why, hello, little lady. What brings you to the park this morning? She tugged her sweater tightly around her shoulders. I'm new here. Just moved. Madeline had not ventured more than a few blocks from her home. The simplicity of her surroundings made it difficult to muster the desire to explore. There were small shops, a church, a library, and several restaurants. The locals shuffled out of their houses at dawn, went to work, and closed by evening. The streets were empty by nighttime, and locals were rarely spotted outside. This had been the most interesting man on Madeline's morning walk since her arrival. Have you been to the neighborhood cemetery? Kids your age go there all the time. If you walk down that path, it should be around the corner. The statement made Madeline feel self-conscious. She knew she was young and did not want to be reminded. Madeline thought she was too old to be called the kid. I'm not as young as you think I am. Aren't you a little too old to be sitting at the park during the day? The man was not hesitant to speak with her before he was now. He seemed to grimace before looking down at his hands. Police sirens blared in the distance. A moment of quiet passed until he spoke again. We can't always make our choices. Sometimes we have to take what is given to us. He reached over to a small backpack on his other side of him and pulled out a container of soup. He turned back to his food and began to scoop tablespoons of his steaming fluid into his mouth. His sweatshirt clung to the bones of his body, framing a thin physique. Would you like a sip? He asked Madeline. Madeline shook her head and looked at the scar in his face. How would you get that? I've had this scar since I was six years old. I fell into a well and my parents had to wait days until the fire department arrived. Our home was far and hard to get to. I don't remember much, except it was dark down there. I didn't think I was going to get out. Madeline nodded in response and wished she had not intruded on the stranger's peace. They sat in silence for a few minutes watching mothers on their way to school. A bird next to the man pecked at food crumbs unperturbed by their presence. She grabbed her belongings and walked back home. She did not turn to look back and neither did he. The dishes were still in the sink and the clothes on the couch remained unmoved. Louisa and Mark, her roommates, had not returned from their outing last night. Louisa was a tall woman who only emerged from her room to go to work or to cook. She spoke with a heavy lisp and had a distinctive mole on the back of her neck the size of a small dime. In her closet were stacks of newspapers from previous years she had not thrown out. There were newspapers from the local town gazette and occasionally international newspapers. Flyers and brochures also went into the closet. It smelled of moist mildew and frayed ink. She was the oldest resident from the three and had lived in the house for half a decade now. Our final reading tonight comes from our guest, the playwright Martina Majok. Prior to COVID-19 this March, we were actually in talks with the New York Theater Workshop to collaborate on a Dreaming Out Loud event in honor of Martina's new play, Sanctuary City. We're very excited for her to join us now. 
Hey, I'm Martina Mayok and I'm a playwright. I was born in Bitom, Poland and raised in Jersey and Chicago and now I'm based in New York City. I'm incredibly proud and honored to be a part of the, this event and thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm going to be reading uh, the opening scene from my play, Cost of Living. Uh, but before I read, I just want to congratulate and celebrate all the writers. You are essential. Please don't ever doubt that your stories are essential, not only for the expansion of every human heart and mind and soul, but for history. For now, you are writing about what it's really like living in these times, what living in America is really like and what it could be. Uh, you are committing a huge act of love and generosity and activism and hope in laying down your truth and we should all be so grateful to get to be gifted with it. So thank you for the work you've already made and thank you for the work you will continue to make and I'm rooting for you always in all things. Cost of living. Prologue, an empty space, an empty stage that is a bar in December, specifically St. Maisie's bar in post Bloomberg Williamsburg, Brooklyn. One might call it a hipster bar. A man, Eddie Torres, an unemployed truck driver. He looks out of place here. Eddie Torres is a man who understands that self-pity and moping are privileges for people who in their lives have friends and family who unconditionally love them and will listen to their shit. Anything he tells you he hopes will be entertaining or funny or interesting because he knows you're not obligated to stay and listen to him. When he slips into sadness, he bounces back fast. He would have made a great uncle. He nurses a glass of seltzer. The shit that happens is not to be understood. That's from the Bible. The shit that happens to you is not to be understood. So see this fuck me up a little when one day comes this call from Columbia Presbyterian. Is Mr. Tortores? There's been a complication. I'm 49 and I've done nothing but love the fuck out of this woman for two decades and a year almost. Nothing. Who deserves that? In a week from her birthday, seven days, we were going to go to Maine for her birthday, see the trees. I leave the lights on now, every room, smoke signal. I'm still here. Holidays are hard. Christmas next week, that's going to be hard. But listen to me, holy shit, the gloom. Get a drink on me. Made a promise to myself, a penalty. I start talking gloom, I get it in the wallet. Let me buy you a drink. What do you want? What do you want? I'm paying. This place is my fucking swear jar. What do you want? Go ahead. Me, myself, personally, I'm off it. That first day you wake up to find you are not in a pool of some kind of liquid, my friend, vomit, say, or piss, that day, that day is a beautiful fucking gift upon your life, man. You are grateful for that day and you are ready. That day is the day it's all going to change. Signs are real. This I know because I used to drive trucks. Cross country. Loved it. Loved every aspect of the job. The scenery. Every aspect. The fucking scenery. Utah. Jesus H, man. Utah's gorgeous and no one even knows. But then I got popped for a DUI in a car. Blocks from home. Lost my CDL. Shit's Creek. So I got the memories and some unemployment. That life is good for people. I was thankful for every day they and Benny at the trucker robots. That life is good. The road, sky, the scenery. Except the loneliness. Except in the case of all the, you know, loneliness. This is what my wife was good for. Not that this was the only thing, but everyone what's married, there's, you know, the fuck days. Like, fuck, what did I do? Like, what did I actually fucking do here? Because, you know, you married a person. And a person's gonna be a person even if they're married. That's a lesson. That's a lesson for your life right there. But still, I, I still, still loved her. She would text me on the road at night in motels, which alone can be, can drum up certain feelings. This is why there's Bibles in motels. We're all of us in motels on the road to somewhere we ain't at yet, and that makes us feel feelings. Roads are dark and America's long. I mean, this wasn't poetry, these texts. This wasn't like, you know, 
poetry. Thinking of you. How's things? Your check came today. Off to bed. Good night. That little buzz in my pocket around the nightstand, that's the rope gets tossed down to you when you're at the bottom of that well. When the thoughts come, you know the thoughts? That loneliness, the text, they're like, climb on up out of there, you know? Get up out of those thoughts, you know? Because thinking of you. Trucker's got wild imaginations, lots of time to think. Just not much time to do much with all we've been thinking except what don't take time at all and what's cheap. Salud. Nostrovia. She taught me that. And sleep. And we sleep. If we can. So I started texting her. After she passed. Like every few days thinking off to bed. Hope you're well. Miss you. I lie a little too. Job hunt's going good. And joke, my love to Jesus. Slip in a good word. <laughs> what are you wearing? It was nice to talk, to think of her. I mean, it was just the nice thing that happened. I owe you another, by the way, for the gloom. So I was hoping that for like community service, they'd give me a gig that was around people, like bringing food to old people or like being in plays, walking puppies, something like that, brushing cats. But I'm painting fences in Livingston. Humane society's full up. So now my phone's got all this paint and it now on the cover I think of you. Well, we shouldn't be here at uh at St. Maisie's here and uh Williamsburg here, all you young people here with your fashions, with your papst. Probably oh, shouldn't be here. This is seltzer, this, for now. It's maybe not good for me right now to be here. Too close, you know how sometimes you get so close, you get just a little too close. Moths, man, like a moth. I know I shouldn't be here, but I'm, tonight I'm, I'm coming home from painting fences, right? Get the train, bus, walk, I'm home, shower, eat, like usual now, alone. And I'm sitting in my house, my apartment, my home, and I'm looking at the boxes, all the boxes of her stuff. And I'm thinking how this was her mug, uh, her bowl, she liked the chair, and I'm tempted. I'm not going to lie, I'm tempted as all fucking fuck. Not even seven yet. Places will be open, stores, and even if they're not, then bars. I can do whatever I want. I remember, I can do what I want, because why not, actually? Actually, why the fuck not? And that's when the phone buzzes on the table. I didn't scream, but shit I jumped thinking of you too. I may or may not have pissed myself at that moment. It's my wife. It's coming from my wife. Her number. Her number. My wife. Fucking, fucking Ani. Anya Wutes Kobranska Torres. My wife. And then I realize, I realize her number, they gave away her number. She's officially gone. And I'm straight up tempted right then. Why not? It's not even seven. Why not? Buzz. The thing buzzes again. Where are you? I wonder how long this person's got my messages for. I wonder if I should be embarrassed. I sent her a picture one time of a fence I painted. I don't remember everything I said. Buzz, I'm at St. Maisie's. This is not my wife. This is not my wife. I know, because, come on, this is not my wife. I want to make that clear to you that I don't think this, but... But in that moment... In that moment, I was comforted to know that she's with the good guys. With St. Maisie. And that heaven is Catholic. Buzz, it's a bar. Buzz. In BK, the fuck is Buzz Brooklyn? Thank you. Buzz Williamsburg. Buzz you. Buzz you. Seven o'clock in Bayonne.
The snow just started falling, and I wonder what to do. This is not my wife. This is not Ani, my wife, but... But honestly, I don't know what else to do, except I do. I do know what else to do. I always know what else I could do, but maybe, maybe something... The shit that happens is not to be understood, and so maybe I should get some fucking pants on and go. I'm in a cab. Okay, my car, don't tell nobody. I'm on the path. I'm on the L. The L. I'm here. I'm here. And nobody looks like my wife. Or at me. Except you. You're... You're real nice. You're a real nice guy, man. I ain't been buzzed yet, texted since, so so maybe whoever, you know, she's gone. Man, ghost never stood you up, man? Shit, listen, I'm either glue. That's number three. You're killing me here. Get a drink. Oh, I mean, no, 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 no. Don't even think about passing. I owe you. My treat. You know what, though? Whoever it is, was, Miss Maisie, St. Maisie, or wherever this place is, fucking, I hope she's having a good night. I say that genuinely, man. Even though she stood me up, the punk, I'm playing. I hope she found someone here and ended up she's having a real good night right now. Whatever that means to her. I hope she found someone to share the night with. That's important. It seemed like she really needed someone to talk to. It's important. Go ahead, man. Drinks on me. Made a promise to myself. Penalty. You get just one more drink for all I put you through. Go ahead. I'm paying. Please. Hi, my name is Hannah Kingsley Ma, and I'm the teaching assistant in the Soho workshop with Alvaro. Um, I wanted to say uh, congratulations to all the students for bringing this anthology into the world. I don't think that writing is easy, and I think it's a lot harder during a crazy global pandemic. And just, I really appreciate that we were able to do this work with one another this past spring of, of sharing each other's work and supporting each other's writing journeys and building a community even under such strange conditions. Um, it's been a real honor to read your work, and I'm so excited for you to share it with the world. So. Thank you and congratulations.